Well, first of all, let me let me thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule um, because we've got a lot to talk about today. Because it, it looks like you're you have quite a bit on your uh, schedule and on your plate um, for the future sure here coming up. <laughs> yes, it is. It's quite, quite busy for Long China. I'm Forty years on. <laughs> So you're doing the Abducted by the 80s tour, um, and I'm hoping to catch you on one of these dates um, in Great. my area, uh, in Clearwater, Florida. Um, <clears throat> tell me a little Great. bit about this tour. It's kind of a almost a greatest hits tour of some really phenomenal bands that you're out on the road with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we've been doing some 80s package tours, you know, over the past few years, you know. Uh, and those tours are great, you know, um, but we, it tends to be quite short sets, you know, so we're playing, it's very much about playing the hits, you know. And we, we're thinking it would be kind of nice to do a tour where we have a bit more time to play, um, you know, not in depth, catalog exactly, you know, but to play To Live and Die in LA, Space Junk, or some of the songs that are, you know, very familiar to people, but, um, you know, wouldn't be included in a sort of 80s package, you know. Um, and so uh, we thought about other bands that we could work with, you know, who would uh, help to draw the bigger crowd, you know, um, and also give people a really great evening of, you know, their various acts, of, you know, different acts, you know, uh, but, but all with this sort of related 80s theme, you know. So uh, the motels, uh, many about hats, uh, animation and naked eyes were kind of na natural choices, really. We've worked with them in the past. They're all really easy to work with. I mean, they're great bands. They've put on a great show. So am I to understand that on this tour, you, you might be breaking out a few of the deeper uh, tracks, or or did I miss that Yeah. Okay. No, that's a great that's what we intend to do, yeah. So uh, I think we'll be doing 40-minute sets, something like that. Um, and so, you know, obviously great. we play the, the hits everybody wants to hear. Uh, but we also play some other stuff. And I think a lot of people, when they come and hear Wang Chung live, uh, A, I think they're surprised that it sounds like a rock band. <laughs> you know, uh, like, like a proper band, you know. Uh, sure. Uh, and B, I think they're, they're sort of like, well, I knew everybody or something like that, but I'd forgotten that Hypnotize Me was also a Wang Chung song. And Let's Go, oh, I always like that. And wow, two of them dying already, that's quite cool, you know. So there's, a, I think, a lot of. Our music, we were fortunate to have our music used in a lot of different contexts, you know, particularly in movies, sure. um, but also adverts. And, and the songs get used in movies still. You know, there's a, an Amazon Prime uh, movie called The Idea of You, uh, which uses dance all days in quite a crucial sex scene. <laughs> <in the middle. laughs> uh, and people are kind of raving about that because I, I think the characters like mime along to the lyrics and... Uh, of course, Dance All Days, if you've ever sat and listened to it, has quite a sinister lyric, <laughs> really. You know? Yeah, sure. So, uh, sure, and I'm sure that makes yeah. it even more memorable in, in that type of scene, right? <laughs> in many ways, yeah. In fact, it reminds me, if we've got time for the story, but, um, you know, we, oh, certainly. We, up, we, did a demo, we did a demo of Dance All Days and, and recorded it, as, obviously did our recording of it, you know. Uh, but we were contacted by um, Quincy Jones, who at the time was working on Michael Jackson's Thriller album. Wow. <laughs> and, and we actually had a meeting with him, and he was like, I love this track, Dance With Those. It's just it's amazing, you know. And, it, and maybe Michael could do it, but you'll have to change the lyrics because it's too weird for Michael's <laughs> And in a really? naive English <laughs> way, we were kind of like, well, I, I don't really want to change the lyrics. You know, it's like, uh, you know, so we, we missed that particular date that would probably have. Uh, uh, well, I think it was good, <laughs> good, very good for Wang Chung because you know it's a very memorable song uh, for you guys. I think so too, you know. But yeah, the publishing uh, side, again. the publishing side of that probably would have been really great from the Michael Jackson side of things. <laughs> oh, for sure, for sure. We'd be, we'd be uh, you know, living in Clearwater, Florida, I imagine. But, uh, <laughs> I'm hoping I can get you to um, settle a, a myth, if you will, about Wang Chung. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, for, for years, people have questioned where the name came from, and, and I've heard two different, two different theories. So I'm hoping you can pin it down and tell us exactly where the name came from. Because one theory I heard was that it's the sound – that you make when you play a guitar, Wang Chung. And the other was mm -hmm. that it is from a book that Nick was reading. 
um, a Chinese book. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping you can elaborate on this because I would love to know the true origin. Yeah. <laughs> well, both are kind of true in a way. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, we were casting around, you know, in the early 80s for a name sure. for the band, you know, because Nick and I and Darren had gone through various incarnations of a band. You know, and I was reading a book at the time on a, on a composer called Karl Stockhausen, who's a, a German, German uh, electronic avant-garde composer, really, but someone I was really into. I still okay. uh, he's actually on the cover of Sergeant Pepper, you know, so he's not totally obscure. You know, but, uh, but anyway, he talked about this thing, Wang Chung, um, and uh, I, I, I was amused by it, you know, but essentially it is a Chinese musical term, and it translates as yellow bell, and the yellow bell is this bell that rings at the center of the universe and creates thousands and millions of frequencies. And our reality is one of those frequencies. And the job of music and of composers is to harmonize with that frequency, to create a sort of harmonious uh, vibe. <laughs> so, you know, um, and, well, I see and, why, and I that, I see why like it resonated with you, yeah, sure. Yeah, it did. Resonate is the right word, you know. You know, but obviously in the early days of you know doing the morning zoo in Chicago and they felt like, well, Wang Chung, you know, we were like, it's just the sound of the guitar. Wang <laughs> <laughs> Chung. That was easier. <clears throat> that was probably yeah. easier for most people to digest in a quick sound bite, right? For, for at, what at the time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. At the time, I think you just needed a quick answer to that question, you know. But the least days. Uh, the, the longer answer seems to make <laughs> more sense, you know. And certainly it's a name that I think we've grown into, you know, rather than kind of going away from, you know, it, it, sort, of, it, it sort of works. Yeah, fantastic. Having well, said well, that, cool. you know, everybody, everybody has fun tonight, everybody Wang Chung tonight, you know, you've got nothing to do with either of these things. <laughs> so, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's in, in, you know, it's embedded in our memories, uh, certainly mine from uh, sure. you know, that time period. And uh, I remember, and it's yeah. probably not that case because you guys certainly were around for a little bit before you struck gold with your, you know, your first single there, the first hit. Um, but, yeah. um, you know, it seemed like you guys pretty much in, you know, in my world, anyway, just kind of came out of nowhere. But I think MTV had a big part in that, in that, you know, they were bringing a lot of these bands to the forefront that I think a lot of us would have missed otherwise. And you guys were like the darlings yeah. of MTV at the time, uh, heavy rotation. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. I remember when To Live and Die in L.A., you know, they, they, they made quite a spectacle out of that, too. So uh, how do you, I mean, obviously MTV is, is really no more these days. I mean, it's not music TV. But looking back on it, I mean, do you feel like they were instrumental in, in the success of Wang Chung early on, of getting, you know, in the in the TV sets of all of us as as viewers and listeners? Well, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there were two major factors. I mean, one was this visual kind of style that it conveyed, uh, and um, but probably more important in a way was that it was one of the first kind of music broadcast systems that was across the states in a uniform kind of way you know mm -hmm. so i think before mtv it was very much about radio and radio stations were unique to each city you know so you might be big in la but you wouldn't necessarily be played in new york and touring, sure. and touring is how you kind of got to the audiences uh, that you couldn't reach with radio sort of thing and, and then that, that combined thing uh, you know, radio would come around or, or whatever, you know. And uh, but with MTV, uh, what you saw in LA was the same as you saw in New York, you know. And so it created this uh, different kind of uh, thing, M more like the UK actually. You know, but you know, the UK obviously is tiny geographically, <laughs> you know, compared with the US. But in the UK, we had the BBC, and that played. That was the one kind of TV channel. But I mean, there was an independent channel as well. But they were basically the same, you know. And um, so, you know, I was talking about this with some friends recently, you know, how, you know, that show like Top of the Pops in the UK, you know, you saw the Beatles and the Stones and a Motown act and maybe some really poppy thing like Cliff Richard and stuff. It was all bunched together. It wasn't sure. formatted into different places. <laughs> and similarly, I think with MTV, you know, you had this 
uh, all these different bands, uh, even though they had a kind of cohesive look because you know, the 80s was a particular thing, you know. Uh, but it, it, you know, it, it gave you this incredible exposure right across the country. Yeah, and it, it kind of unified the scene. I think you're right. Um, and sort of brought a lot of these bands, you know, together. But, um, <clears throat> but yeah. yeah, I remember seeing, <laughs> remember seeing those videos in heavy rotation back in the day. Yeah, uh, so yeah. tell me a little yeah. bit about... I, mean, I have my own... Sorry, I was yeah, going to say, I have my own misgivings about MTV and the way it sort of changed the way people yes. approached music, you know, because, you know, in the 70s, obviously, uh, you know, a band like Led Zeppelin wouldn't even release a single, you know, let alone make a video. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, it would be you know, insane. You know, they got Pink Floyd making pop videos. You know? um, yeah, so exactly. So in, in that way, you know, you, you were very much kind of... It was a, without being too pretentious about it, it's sort of theater of the mind, if you like. You, you listen, it was a purely sonic experience listening to a Led Zeppelin album, you know, and you, your mind has created the visuals for you, you know. Uh, with uh, 80s MTV, you have kind of spoon-fed the visuals, and, and I think that was maybe a shame in, in certain respects, you know. But hey, I'm, I don't want to bite the hand that's eating, you know, it's, it's <laughs> certainly great for one chance. <laughs> sure. So I understand, uh, rumor tells me that you guys might be releasing a Greatest Picks package maybe later this year or yeah. early next year. Can you tell yeah. me a little about that? Well, uh, we are, uh, you know, working furiously, uh, <laughs> as far as you can, to work furiously on that sort of thing. Um, I mean, we've been working for four or five years, really, on trying to release a sort of whole back catalog thing, you know, which has proved quite tricky to do in this day and age, you know. Uh, but as a taster for that, we decided to go with this Greatest Hits package. Uh, mm-hmm. It's going to be principally a double vinyl album called Clear Light, Dark Matter. And it's uh, the uh, first album is going to be the hits, as people know them. But particularly, we're going to be using all the single uh, versions that were released at the time. So, you know, at the time, there were the album versions, and then you usually had a slightly different edit for radio. Uh, sure. And it's those versions that are going to populate the first album. And then the second album is going to consist of uh, stuff that's never been heard before, sort of some demos, there's like the demo for Dance All Days on it, and also mm. some tracks that we recorded around the time of To Live and Die in L.A., which never came out at the time because they wow. found To Live and Die in L.A. <laughs> to release the, you know, the earlier tracks. And there's also some tracks from our very first album where the name is spelt slightly differently, H-U-O-N-G for Huang. And um, and so there's a, a track, uh, some, some stuff that basically came to light that we, I'd forgotten that we'd uh, recorded these songs that didn't even go onto that album. You know. So uh, hopefully for uh, avid fans, it's going to have some stuff they've never heard before. And and for people who are new to Wang Chung, it's going to be a sort of fascinating insight into our creative process. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I love it when, when artists do that, when you guys release stuff. Because, I mean, if you're a true fan of the band, like I am, I'd love to hear, uh, you know, stuff that maybe was originally on the cutting room floor or just for whatever reason didn't fit into the overall cohesiveness of something you were working on. And so it just sort of fell through the cracks originally. I mean, I I love that kind of stuff because it's it's still a snapshot in time, I think. So, um, you know, of your style, your playing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You'd like to have to I was going to say, the, uh, you know, I'm a total fan of those kind of completist things, you know, like, yeah. so there's a lot of David Bowie stuff that's been coming out, you know, of uh, outtakes and different versions of things, and, uh, and the Beatles as well, obviously, the anthology and, um, you know, that, that Peter Jackson, you know, get back stuff, you know, where you get this uh, real insight into their creative process, and uh, uh, again, without going too much off track, something that interests me is, you know, how this kind of golden age of pop music, rock music, whatever you want to call it, which I say runs from maybe 1956, you know, when Elvis first broke through, to say 2006, you know, with Radioheads in Rainbows, something like that. You know, that was a 50-year period, you know, where some incredible music came out, you know. And music was like a sort of cutting edge of art and fashion and culture mm-hmm. in, in so many ways, you know. And, and it's like so... And I, and I think it's like come to an end. I'm you know, sure there's bands and there's, there's, there's music and, and stuff, but it's, it's, it's no longer the cutting edge. 
and and it's a different experience of the way music fits into the culture. I think you know because of social media, because of the internet, computers, which has sort of changed consciousness in such a profound way. I think. And so uh, I'm very interested in like you know, how do you sort of preserve this music in a way. You know, so with classical music, obviously you've got the scores. And the scores is like the blueprint of how that what that music is, and you can perform it and so on. But with rock music, there are no scores. You know, people didn't write stuff down. So what you do have is the, the outputs. You know, the the, the cutting room floor, as you as you put it. You know, and that gives you that sort of uh, context for the creative process of that. You know, and I think I think all that stuff is just very very important. Yeah, and and like I said, that's that's why I'm a fan of it because I like to know. Yeah. you know, all the, all the ins and outs, the behind the scenes uh, stuff. And it, it does as a completist, if you're a fan of the band, it lets you piece together, you know, things that are happening around album releases and things that were done at a specific time. And so you see more of a, I think a creative flow sometimes to, uh, to what the artist was doing and planning at the time that we weren't privy to otherwise, you know, <laughs> Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, you know, incredible the sort of access to music now and, and how you can get to those what used to be really obscure fan type things, you know, are now really readily available. So, what do you think about? I know this is probably a loaded question, but what do you think about streaming services with music these days? <laughs> yeah, double-edged sword. I think you know, for uh, I mean, I think the accessibility is great. Uh, and I think for a band like Wang Chung, where we have a name, you know, like we're sort of a legacy act, <laughs> as they call it, you know, uh, sure. streaming services work pretty well, you know, in that people are kind of like curious, they've got access to the music, you know, in good quality. Uh, so it works for us, you know. Sure, we don't make the money that we used to make uh, sure. from like radio play, but then we get a lot more streams than we ever got radio play, you know. So, I'm not saying it quite balances, but it's still pretty good to me. Uh, yeah, I think... I think the downside... Mm-hmm. Sorry, you go on. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I think for a lot of people, it's opened up an exploration into bands and artists that have their material out there streaming that they, for whatever reason, missed an album or just never heard it before. Um, you know, now they have that option to go listen to that and explore a little bit deeper. Um, so I think that's on the positive side, but yes, I totally agree on the other side that it, it, there there yeah. definitely are some problems, especially with the payments, I believe. <laughs> I think that's right. And if I was a, a young band, you know, or either young band, um, you know, and was you know, into into recording and, and took a great deal of care over that stuff and you know, the pittance <laughs> that you get for people listening to it. You know, it, it's not an adequate reward for the work that goes into to making those things. So, so I think it's tougher for young bands to make it. You know, and I think you've got to be in that bracket. You know, where you're selling, you know, you're getting billions of streams. You know, to, to really make it pay, or maybe millions yeah. still pay. You know? <laughs> but yeah, so I, I think it's, it's and also it brings around the situation where music becomes a bit like photography. <laughs> you know, I mean, which is like anybody can pick up a camera and take a photograph and anybody can pick up a laptop and make a record, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And uh, and that, you know, well, is a great thing, you know, because I think, well, <clears throat> it's such an, an amazing thing to do. Uh, but on the other hand, it means there's just this massive amount of noise that you've got to get heard above before you can really start making your mark, you know. But I do believe that, uh, you know, good artists do get heard, you know, and they attract uh, a following and, you know. So, yeah. I, I think the music business is, you know, yeah, if you want to get rich, <laughs> try something else, you know. Uh, but but <clears throat> in a way, maybe it's always, maybe it's always been like that. <laughs> so maybe it's like that. I agree with you 100% on that. And, and there there does seem to be a large glut, if you will, of people just producing massive amounts of material as bands, some of which who can't even play them live. I don't, I don't mean that to sound bad for some of those artists. But, you know, there's a lot of – it's yeah. easier to produce music nowadays. Um, and so yeah. I really respect guys. You know, like you guys are true musicians. Um, that doesn't happen a lot these days. Um, and it, it definitely no. seems backwards from what we knew originally um, in the re- record industry yeah. back yeah. years ago. They would hire you to, yeah. a, a, you know, a contract, groom, you know, the artist, put them out there. Now it's sort of like you have to make it first. 
and then the record yep. company might talk to you, right? So <laughs> very yeah. strange. It is. Yeah. No, I think nowadays you know bands are on, on the you know playing live is where they make their money. I'm probably selling merch. <laughs> merch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And, and, and recordings are, well, like photography, they're just like little snapshots. And, and I think people's attitude to recording is that it's rather, it's just the moment and it's very disposable, you know. Whereas I think when I was making uh, albums in the early, well, in the mid 80s, you know, uh, there was a sense that, you know, like Dance All Days, we weren't making a snapshot of Dance All Days on that particular day. We were making the definitive version of it <laughs> that sure. would be for posterity. <laughs> sort of thing. Uh, sure. and, and I think Absolutely. that came out of the whole model of you know, the Beatles albums, really, in, in particular. You know, an album like Sgt. Pepper was not meant to be played live. It was the recording was the thing. You know? And I think sure. that legacy was still there in the 80s. There's a sense that your job as a rock musician was to make the perfect album. <laughs> you know? And then geeks were about trying to replicate how great that album was. You know? um, so I think that's kind of got lost slightly in the mix. And, and I think that's maybe one of the things that's made the music business come loose from its moorings a bit, really, you know, because, um, you know, live shows are great, you know, uh, but bands, uh, their reputations rest with their albums, you know, and that's true yeah. even with classical players, you know, and classical musicians have a very poor attitude to recording, I think, you know, <laughs> you know and fair enough, you know, you go to see the symphony orchestra play, and it's great. And it's just, it's, again, even there, it's the recordings of the things that people had in their hands, in their houses, that they, you know, remember. Uh, not not a live gig, you know. So as much as you might come to see Wang Chang and you know really enjoy it, you know, you'll go home and play the records. <laughs> so sure. it's, uh, very I true. Think <laughs> recordings are very important. You know, yeah, recordings are really important, and you know, long may they continue to be made with care and love. You know. So someone put a little bug in my ear to ask you, and I'm not sure what this is about, so I'm hoping you can fill me in, about Wang Chung on the moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is um, uh, some uh, friends of ours uh, who are massive Wang Chung who work in the space industry. Uh, and there was a, a moonshot recently uh, for the first American uh, lander to land on the moon. It was back in February, I think. Uh, and a company called uh, Intuitive Machines uh, actually uh, got the, the package together, as it were, the payload. Uh, I think NASA was helping as well. But it, like a, you know, the space industry these days is about private enterprise as well as the sort of government funded stuff, you know. Sure. Uh, and uh, so this uh, module landed on on the moon. Uh, and this friend of ours called us up and said, yeah, we've managed to land it, it's touched down safely, uh, and your album covers and some family photographs that you sent us, we've got them on a data storage unit that's on this lander. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. It's kind of just a crazy thought, you know, I was walking in, wow. I was in Canterbury, which is an old, old medieval city in the UK, and I was walking into town through this old medieval gateway and the full moon was like shining down over this ancient city, you know, and obviously how long, how many millions of years has the full moon shone down on the earth, you know? And sure. I thought, shit, you know, this Wang Chun stuff is actually physically there <laughs> on that <laughs> thing. And it was that kind of mind blowing moment, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, absolutely. That's a so cool Wang, honor too. Wang Chun. Oh, it's a real honor, you know. But uh yeah, we we had some Good friends in the space industry, you know, and, and I think for whatever reason, Wang Chang has a sort of reputation, you know, in that industry and also in the military a bit as well. There's some really massive Wang Chang fans, you know. Um, <laughs> I remember being on a flight sitting next to this guy and I had some massive pins that a friend had given me on my on my leather jacket. And he said, he said You're wearing the NASA pins, are you involved in that? And I said, Well, no, I'm a, I'm a musician, you know, that I'm interested in. Oh, I, I work in Space Force. <laughs> <laughs> and we got talking, and he's a huge Wang Chung fan, you know, saying that he's uh, his five star general who he drove around oh. and stuff, you know, was really into Wang Chung. That's incredible. And yeah. and, yeah, it is, you know, so, yeah, uh, it's something I'm very proud of, actually, you know, and, and obviously, latterly, I've been uh, more public about my interest in UFOs and, and stuff, and, um, you know, I've been doing some solo projects for sort of touch on some of that stuff. and. Uh, so um, uh, there's a single I released uh, last year, in fact, called Since 2017, which references the, the 
God, of the UFO, UAP stuff that's been happening um, since the New York Times did a big article on it. And uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's a whole interesting area. You know, but by jumping on the moon, I'm very proud. Of <laughs> well, tell me, I guess you know we're. I know you're probably limited on your time, so I don't want to take up too much of your time today because certainly you have other people to speak with about the uh, uh, tour. But what would you like to say to your fans and what would you like to let them know uh, about this tour, um, upcoming releases? Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of time just to just to talk directly to your fans. Yeah. Well, I, I guess you know, uh, this year, for, uh, 2024, it's, uh, 1984, it's 40 years this year from the release of Points on the Curve, so 40 years from, from Darts All Day, Don't Let Go, Don't Be My Enemy, and uh, all that MTV stuff, you know. And uh, so I, I guess uh, I am just, in, and I know Nick, which is so this too, supremely grateful, you know, for the fans who stuck with us over the years, especially given that we sort of took a large chunk of time out <laughs> during the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, but I'm, I'm just very grateful that people stuck with the music and that the Wang Chung uh, legacy, for want of a better word, you know, has withstood the test of time, you know, uh, the fans and also all the people that have used our music in their creative pro- uh, products themselves, you know, music producers and directors and people in commercials and uh, you know, everyone from the Simpsons to, you know, Amazon Prime. You know, so really grateful to all that support we've had, you know. and uh, and I hope that exactly by the 80s, if you can come out to see it, you know, it's going to be a thrill to see the motels and us and many uh, hats, and ocean, naked eyes, uh, and it's going to be uh, you know a window back into that 40 years ago, but it's also going to be a celebration of the present and the fact that we're still alive <laughs> and still <laughs> got the energy and the desire to want to play that music and have a great. Music. Well, I am absolutely looking forward to that. I encourage everyone to go out and, and catch you guys on this tour. Um, you know, you guys are, are more than just um, uh, musicians, more than just artists. I feel like Wen Chung and, and other artists on this bill, too, fall into, like, a cultural icon at this point. Um, and, you know, having yeah. celebrations like a 40-year anniversary is just fantastic. So you've been just a pleasure to talk to and very enlightening um, in our conversation. And I certainly appreciate you taking time out uh, to speak with us at Excess Rock today. That's a real pleasure, Bobby. Uh, thanks for taking the time yourself. And, uh, 